The theme for this Sunday is The Savior's Sermon, Live a Holy Life The word holy comes from an old English word, halling which means whole or healthy. We have a holy God. He wants us to live a holy life, one that is wholly dedicated to Him, one that is spiritually and emotionally healthy for us. So, as Jesus continues His Sermon on the Mount, He makes a crucial point that not all His followers, including present-day followers, understand well. Jesus came to free us from sin. He did not come to free us to sin. God commands that we live a holy life. He provides dire warnings to remind us just how holy He wants us to be. Today we face a rapid decline in public morals and private piety. Yet, Jesus calls His followers to be different. He urges personal purity. After examining our lives, we can only despair over our lack of holiness. So, the Gospel acclamation reminds us to flee to Christ who loves us despite our failures and who sacrificed Himself for unholy people. Secure in His grace and empowered by the Holy Spirit, each day we strive to live the holy lives to which we have been called. Good morning. I rejoice with those who said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I pray our hearts are filled with joy on this day, too, as we gather around God's Word, are encouraged and reminded of the importance of living every day to Jesus, living a holy life. What does that look like? Uh, One one of the things that we we highlight here, this balance, I'll talk about that a little bit with the uh, kids and uh, the children's message, the importance of balancing uh, and, and the understanding. Jesus has come to set us free. We're free. But what we're free from is we're free from sin. We're not free to sin. Sometimes we get confused on that point. Jesus means it when he calls on us to live a holy life. Not so that you are saved, but because you are. Not because to be saved, but because you are saved. May that be our focus, our reminder, our encouragement today as we continue on that uh, short little epiphany season series of the Savior's Sermon on the Mount today, our focus, live a holy life. We turn to page two, we begin our worship and the opening response. Friends, God says when we call on His name, He's with us. So we begin in the name of our God as He's made Himself known to us, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with the true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed You in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve Your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us, Christ, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and He's given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In that peace of forgiveness, let us praise our Lord. We join with that opening hymn, O God, my faithful God. We go to our Lord with the prayer of the day. Lord God, in mercy receive the prayers of your people. Grant them the wisdom to know the things that please you and the grace and power always to accomplish them. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Good morning. You guys ready for Kingdom Kids? You're going to hear today Jesus' important words, which basically is this. Be good. Are you guys good? Huh? Do you guys get along? These little sisters pulling big sisters' hair. Twin, they're actually twins, right? Th- th- this is that reminder, right? Right? And pastor's putting you on the spot. You're a little nervous, so we fidget. And... But we all want to be good, right? It's, it's awesome when we're good, because when we're good, who's happy? <coughs> Who do you think's happy? Is mom happy? Is dad happy? When you're good, when you listen, are they happy? You bet they are. But you know who else is happy? Jesus is. See, because Jesus wants us all to be good. Why? So he'll be our friend? No. Guess what? He already is. I wish I could be good all the time, but it doesn't happen. But you know what? Even on those days when it doesn't happen, I know Jesus still loves me. Right? Because he always loves me, I always want to try my best more and more and more every day. Not so that he'll like me. He already does. Not so I can go to heaven. We're already going there because what Jesus did. But because I know that, he says... Listen, listen and try to be good every day. And that's what we're going to focus in on today. Let's say our prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your blessings. May you guide us and encourage us always to give our best to you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can go back to Kingdom Kids. Thank you. Be holy. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. How does that work? Well, our first lesson recounts again that infamous event in the life of powerful, wonderful, awesome King David. Remember David? Right? He helped Saul through his troublesome times. He played the harp. He soothed the spirit. God was with him. David took on Goliath. David was the great warrior king. He served his Lord faithfully, and God blessed him. And how does he respond? We're going to hear it today. What was David thinking? What was David thinking? Well, some would say he wasn't thinking. Isn't that our excuse sometimes? What? I didn't know. I wasn't thinking. Still wrong. Still a sin. That's what God wants to talk to you and I about today, too. I'll get into it a little bit more in our sermon meditation. And I planted the seed already. What was David thinking? In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants. 
and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home, so he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drink, or made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat along his, among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah in a place, at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson again continues on with this focus, the importance of living holy lives. The encouragement here from the Apostle Paul as he writes to his fellow Christians in Thessalonica, Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, it doesn't stop. And that's what Paul gets at here. More and more and more. We have to keep on doing this more and more and more. We don't get to say, well, I did it once. Shouldn't that be good enough? Because I tried it once. It didn't work. People didn't love me back, so I'm out. More and more and more. We keep going. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 12. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual morality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Here ends our second lesson a verse of the day taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 5, we read, Hallelujah, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. invite those that are able to please stand for our gospel reading today. Dear friends, we stand in respect of the Holy Gospel. Our Lord gives us through the gospel writer Matthew. We're reading in the fifth chapter beginning at the 21st verse. 
Glory be to you, O Lord. Our Savior's Sermon on the Mount continues in this third part. Again, this is our sermon text as well. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is, unan- is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gifts. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of a divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual morality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to simply say, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Here ends our gospel reading. Praise be to you, O Christ. I invite you to continue with me in confessing our faith today with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Continue. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends. As I mentioned, the word of our Lord, we'd like to base our meditation as we continue in our epiphany journey as God reveals Himself, makes Himself known, but also as we've been highlighting, also as He makes ourselves known. In these weeks, in revealing the truth of His Word, speaking, preaching, this beautiful... I saw one announcement, right? The the best sermon ever. The Sermon on the Mount. These three weeks, we've broken up that, that sermon. We started, of course, with the introduction. Jesus' beatitude. Blessed. 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 Blessed are you. Right? And that's what we take away from that. Not do all these things so you can be blessed. No, it just starts out with this reminder. You're blessed. Even if you're mourning and crying. Even if you're dealing with trials and challenges. If your life's not perfect, which 
guessing it's all of us because none of us are perfect. We're blessed. We're blessed by God. Then last week we highlighted right, His call. Let your light of love shine. Be the salt of the earth. Right? You, you're, you are this. You are. And this is where we start today also. You are a disciple of Christ. And I can say that confidently because you're here. You're opening your hearts and your spirit and your soul to your Lord. The Holy Spirit is speaking through you, talking to you. You're learning. Christ has made you a disciple. And through faith, which the Holy Spirit has given to us all, through the power of that Word, through the sacrament of baptism, we have faith. And what does that faith do? That faith saves. Because that that faith trusts and relies on what Christ has accomplished for us. So I came. That's why I lived. That's why I had to die on that cross. He had to do all of that for us, and He did it. He's given us salvation. He's made us His own. And He's called us to be His own. And in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preaches to all of us today, and He says, and by the way, this is what it looks like. We're going to live by the rules? Let's live by the rules. Okay. But don't get confused. See, and that's what had happened with many of God's people during the time that Jesus lived. They had gotten so focused on the rules, they thought it was about the rules. And this is where we find Jesus today. And this is where, again, we, we come back and, and why. I wanted to sing all six verses of Take My Life and Let It Be. See, because those last two verses are key. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, because the heart is at the matter here. The heart matters. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Because ultimately, that's what Jesus is wanting from us. He gave his all. And what is he asking? Give me your all. And what does that look like? It doesn't look like what David did. Okay? What was he thinking? We can analyze and look at that story and that account, but the matter of the fact was he wasn't thinking and his heart wasn't thinking. He was God's chosen king, and God had blessed him in so many ways, but at that moment in time, he didn't care. And so we are so quick, so ready to point our finger at David and say, shame on him. How dare he? But understand that lesson today isn't in there as a simple example and lesson of what not to do. It's, it's there as all these other words are there for us today to focus in and to remember what Jesus knows about us and what Jesus is talking to us about. See, it's about our heart. It's about our heart. See, because he had some incredible, awesome rule followers. They, they were known as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They, they, they were the ones the first... Again, shout out and and condemn David's adulterous and murderous plan. That goes against the rules. And look at us. We're faithful. We have our one wife and we are dedicated and we are committed and we are focused. 
oh, but by the way, because we're the religious leaders and that was going on in Jesus' time, we're going to write up some exemptions and exceptions. That You know what? If my wife doesn't cook good enough of a meal, I can write her a divorce and say we're done and I can go marry someone that cooks better. Or I can write this letter that says, you know what, I realize you really don't love me and I don't love you, so here, I'll write this letter of divorce. We're separated. It's okay. We can go on. They established different rules, and even back then, they made divorce easy. But they thought, well, we're following the rules. We write out a letter. We write out a script of divorce. Like Moses said, we're okay. It's okay. So Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, calls out the rule followers. And he says, friends, it's more than just the outward action. It's more than just thinking you're following a rule and because you're following that rule, you're okay. If you follow all the rules that God establishes, but your heart is so far from God because you're so focused on what those rules are, and especially what all the additional rules and qualifications and specifications are, that that's all you're thinking about, and you're going through it, and your heart is so far away from God, He's not happy. But here's the incredible thing. God's not happy, but He's not angry. He's sad. He's hurt. He's not angry. He's not, oh, those rule breakers and start throwing lightning bolts at us. That's not how our God works. He comes to us today with these words. And these these powerful, incredible words are summed down into this one key thought and point. It's a matter of the heart. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Yeah, but God, they did that, so it's okay for me to be angry. There's no qualifications here. I could, again, give testimony. I could, even though Jesus says don't do it, swear on a stack of Bibles, I have never, ever, ever, ever murdered anyone. Ever. Not even by accident. I've been in a few accidents. But no one died, thank God. So I can honestly, truly say I haven't murdered anybody. But as those that have been in Bible studies, Bible classes and discussions know, I'm the middle child. I have an older brother. I have a younger brother. Anyone who is angry with a brother or sister? Guilty. That's me. I'm guilty of murder. That's me. I broke the one commandment I didn't think I was guilty of breaking. Because I got angry with my brother. Because Jesus reminds me it's the heart that matters. Where's our heart? Oh, you can do all the actions. You can be able, you're, you're sitting here in church today. Good job. Check that off, right? Good disciple. Faithful. Way to go. Pat ourselves on the back. But where's your heart? Were you honest with yourself right now? Were you looking around and this morning coming in and saying, hmm, where's that person? Where's that person? I wonder where that person is. Well, I'm here. They're not. I'm better than they are. It's an easy temptation. It's an easy trap to fall into. Right? We love playing the comparison game sometimes. Jesus says, stop it. Jesus says, stop it. Jesus is talking to each and every one of us as an individual, single person here. Right? 
I'm saying, where's your heart at? Where's your heart? It's a matter of the heart. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there. Go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gifts because it's a matter of the heart. Settle matters quickly with your adversary. Get it handled. Just take care of it. Because here's the reality. You might lose. You might end up in, in jail. And if you end up in God's jail, you don't get out until you pay every last cent that you owe, which none of us will ever, 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 ever be able to do. So this is why the confession of our sins is so vital and important. This is why it's in a preeminent priority spot when you and I gather for worship. We take care of that right away. We come together and we take those sins and we lay them at the foot of the altar and we say, God, I am sorry. But see, God wants that, not sorry, 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 sorry. There, I said the words. Mean it. It's a matter of the heart. Recognize it. Own it. Right? That's a, that's a big term phrase now. Own it. Own it. Make it yours. Well, own this. Own your sin. Let, let God's word speak to you today. Right? Man, Paul's words there to the Thessalonian church. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Do this more and more. Love all of God's family. We know you're trying, but do it more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands. Be productive. Just stay focused. Those are powerful words. That's Jesus in love coming to you and I and guiding and directing us and saying, let's do this. Let's do this. So you can be saved? No. You already are. Friends, Jesus loves us. Jesus came here. And He lived a perfect life for us, for me, for you, for the whole world. Sometimes we use that, God so loved the world, we think about the world, we, we allow that globalness to be so massive that we forget that we all matter to Him. He knows us all very intimately, very personally, and He truly, perfectly cares. He does. He cares about you. He gives His all to you. And so He was reminding those. And yeah, He was very pointed. He was pointed to the Pharisees and the experts in the law. He was pointed to the people. And saying, I'm telling you, it isn't about this. If you think it's about this and you stumble and your eye causes you to do this, gouge it out. Jesus was not encouraging self-mutilation. That would be breaking His own law, His own command that says... Don't hurt or harm your body. But it was shock. It was awe. He's waking the people up saying, don't worry, this is outward stuff. Stop. It's about the heart. Where is your heart? The heart matters. That's what Jesus wants you and I to know every day. And so we sang, take my heart and let it be. May our hearts be focused on this incredible love that Jesus has for us. May our hearts be focused and understand what He's calling us to do today. To give our hearts to Him. Right? Wish I could say I planned it, but I didn't. <coughs> but God did. Right? This Tuesday, 
one of those hallmark holidays. That's one we celebrate because we rejoice in love. We rejoice in the partnerships that husbands and wives they have and enjoy. So we let the kids have fun with their little sugar valentine cookies and cakes and encourage each other. We support each other. It's not a holiday we have to shy away from because even the single person, the individual person, the lonely person, the widow, the widower, the divorcee, whatever reason we might be alone and by ourselves. We're not. We're not alone. Because Jesus loves us. And, and not just with the word, not just with the Valentine card. Jesus has given us His all. He's given Himself in every way, shape, and form. Not because we're good, but because we needed Him. And He loved us enough to do that. And what does he say? Just love. Love him. Give him your heart. Don't worry about all the rules and regulations. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Build yourself, your reputation, your time that this time you don't have to swear on a stack of Bibles because this time you want people to know you're really telling the truth and maybe those other times you didn't so much. Jesus says, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just be real. Be true. Understand and know every day. It's the heart that matters. It's because Jesus has given His all because He cares not just about where you're sitting at this moment in church or in front of your computer screen and watching this message right now. cares where your heart is at and he wants your heart committed and focused and dedicated to him because he bought it he paid the price for it and he did that because he loves you every day he, even when we can relate to one sister grabbing the other sister's hair and pulling it and saying i love you sister We have those days. Jesus understands that. And He still loves us. We have those days and Jesus has come. Repent. Give me your heart. Because I'm giving you mine. Friends, He loves us perfectly and completely. And yeah, He wants us to do it right. He wants us to be holy and perfect but not on the outside. He wants our heart because the heart matters. Let's give Him our hearts. Not just on Tuesday, February 14th. Let's give Him our hearts every day because it's His. And there isn't a better person out there for us to commit and dedicate our heart every day than to our perfect Lord and Savior who's given us all for us. So may we walk with our hearts in that sanctified living, giving it our best every day and knowing Jesus is by our side. To Him be the glory and may His peace reign in your hearts and minds. Amen. We turn to page 11 in our service folders. Let's join together in that verse. Create me a clean heart, O God.
Take this time now to bring our offerings of love and thanks to our Lord. We go to our Lord at the prayer of the church. We think about those folks that are hurting and suffering, dealing with uh, challenges. We keep them in our prayers as well, and we'll join together in the Lord's prayer as well. We go to our Lord because he invites us to pray to him always. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Lord of glory, you delight in making yourself known to us and others. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of your powerful, needful reminders and encouragement through that Sermon on the Mount. You again speak to us today, your disciples. You guide us, you direct us, you encourage us, and you remind us of your incredible love. Yes, Lord, you call us to faithful service. And we are sorry that so often we fail. We are in awe of your perfect love. We are in awe of your humbleness and your patience, your willingness to continue to guide us, encourage us, and direct us as you do again today. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your blessings. Encourage us, remind us, and motivate us that every day we give our all, our best to you, not to earn your favor, not to earn or gain our place with you or that place in heaven, but because it's already ours. Through your incredible redeeming work, your awesome love, display of kindness and patience to us all, you have saved us. Help us to live and express and show that truth in all we do and say. Again, Lord, we are sorry for our failings. We are sorry for our weaknesses. We rejoice and the reminder, the encouragement that you say again to us today, keep going, keep offering more and more and more and more. Help us to run that race with perseverance. Dear Jesus, you revealed your glory through your incredible signs and wonders. We trust in your power and your truth. We trust in your call, your command that we pray to you, that we call upon you in days of trouble and hardship. And Lord, we ask that you again be with those that are sick and suffering, those that are hurting, those that are dealing with many challenges and trials. Again, at this time, Lord, we think especially and specifically of Kyle, who's Steve and Judy's grandson, who again this past week just went through another major round of chemotherapy as he battles leukemia in his young body. Lord, we ask that you would again give comfort, strength, and according with your will and blessings, bless that treatment that is undergoing. Lord, we also put before you today Stephanie's sister Sue. She had a chance to talk to her yesterday. We know that now, in the coming days, this starting this Monday for the next six weeks, she'll be going through some intense radiation and chemotherapy as well. Lord, be with her, and give comfort and assurance. And Lord, according to your will, we ask that you would provide that bit of medical uh, miracle working and, and help and guide and direct this treatment to, to help eradicate and take away that, that cancer that has attacked her brain. Give her the physical strength, but above all, give her that spiritual comfort and assurance of your presence and the love of her family with her. Give to Steph and her family that assurance that you are there. You have a plan, you have a purpose, you have a way of making it all work out and that we simply trust and pray your will be done. So Lord, we come to you asking that you be with those that are sick and suffering, those that are hurting, and help them, and bless them, give them strength, give them encouragement, and help us all to walk, Lord, faithfully with you each and every day. We come to you, Lord, with that prayer you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts that blessing from our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. We close our service with that closing hymn, Jesus Calls Us, or the Tumult. To receive notifications of new Our Savior's YouTube videos, please subscribe. Our Savior's Lutheran Church, of Port Orange, Florida, uploads their Sunday service on the following Monday. The video has copyrighted material removed for compliance.